as we begin this new study on this most vital subject, and especially in the exchange between these two exponents of conflicting views centuries ago on an issue that concerns us even more vitally today, give us wisdom as we ponder the issues and uh, grant that we are all Israelites in whom there is no guile, who will have the word of God have free course in us and be constrained by its teaching alone, trembling at its word. For Christ's sake we ask it, amen. Let me make a few preliminary announcements while you get your coffee and, and so on, and then we'll explain about the distribution of these uh, uh, handouts for the morning. Please notice there'll be no class here at 9.30 and 11 next uh, week. Frank and Buck are both going to be away, and I'm, they've asked me to preach, so I have to cancel these two classes, but it doesn't affect any of the uh, others. And that um, tonight we take up the subject of pantheism, probably the most profound heresy that's ever threatened uh, the Christian religion. And tomorrow morning, I call your attention on the Westminster Confession Studies. We're in the uh, heart of our official teaching on the matter of the Christian life. The Westminster Confession of Faith, you know, is not only the classic document of Reformed uh, doctrine in the Presbyterian tradition, but it's still our official creed. When the United Presbyterian Church USA adopted, for example, the Book of Confessions in 1967, the chief architect of that was constantly saying, that is just the roof on the structure. He would have no use for the Book of Confessions except that it was the roof on the structure, and the structure is the Westminster Confession of Faith. So as we resume our study of the Westminster Confession and conclude uh, it, I call your attention to the fact that if you can get there in the mornings, Monday mornings there, you'll be in a very vital area in the official teaching of the church. This is still the most widely used creed in uh, Reformed, uh, in Presbyterian uh, Christendom. Now, I make a reference to the two announcements you'll find in your bulletins. Those of you who've been at the early service have already done so. Those of you who'll be going to the 11 o'clock service will notice two very important uh, abortion meetings. Those of you who were with us in the contemporary issues class here last uh, time, remember we opened up with a discussion of that, and there's a great deal of discontent in this congregation and in many other congregations throughout the denomination because the denomination sounds as if it's uh, pro-abortion in its stance. Now, this uh, opposition on the part of many clergy and, uh, and lay members of the church is taking concrete form here in the Presbytery of South Kansas. And you'll see two announcements about it in the bulletins, one about a local meeting on the 8th of this month and another about a presbytery meeting. In our very last session of the Contemporary Issues last week, the question, or I think it was two sessions before that, uh, the question came up how to uh, uh, influence your church on this type of uh, thing. Well, we have a hierarchical structure beginning with a local church which elects its session and then sends representatives to the next higher court called the Presbytery, which in this case is the Presbytery of South Kansas, and then the Senate, and then the General Assembly meeting uh, once a year. Now, here some individuals and some churches have expressed deep displeasure with that type of position and, the, and in favor of the so-called pro uh, life position. You have an opportunity to meet with these people on the 8th, and then your, your uh, session members, whoever is going to the Presbytery meeting, I think it's the 16th, will be there. I am not involved in this. I'm a member of another Presbytery, and I'm very, very studiously avoiding it, lest anybody think I'm putting my nose in where I have no uh, business. But it is your business, the business of this particular Presbytery and this congregation as it's concerned. I, I call your con uh, attention to it, and I hope you can do whatever is possible. I just got a letter uh, through the mail about a uh, vehement efforts being made in the denomination, again, at uh, various churches especially concerned, to prevent this slow but steady and undeniable drift toward the condoning of homosexuality even in the ministry, and contrary to the San Diego uh, General Assembly's uh, deliverance. You'll probably hear more about that later on, but it's just an indication of the fact that these contemporary issues which are very much in the center of our uh, concern here, are creating reactions, not just departures from the church, but actual reactions to deal with the issue and try to cope with the problem. But here is some place where you can get in on the action yourselves, and if you'll read the bulletin, you'll find the uh, details. Now, with respect to this course, do any of you not have this handout 
They've been, uh, un, uh, can you get, uh, are there any more? They're all gone. I'm sorry about that for the morning. Apparently about 50 people enrolled and they took it rather seriously over there and produced 50 copies. But people come in and out and so on. So I'll have at least 50 more run off for next uh, week. But in the meantime, well, those of you who do have copies, remember this is our basis of study for the entire course. Try to hold on to it and bring it. I know some of you will lose it and forget it and so on. We'll have uh, emergency aid for that, but try to, uh, try to not only to keep it, but try to remember on a Sunday morning to, uh, to bring it because we're moving slowly. This is all there is to it. You remember I produced one of these almost every week last time or uh, something, but this is the, the whole study and it's a very slow and deliberate, and as we call it there, a doing theology course, where I'd like you to get uh, active uh, in the matter. It's not necessary, and uh, you'll never be called on or anything like that, but you're highly encouraged to do the kind of study uh, that we have um, here. The theme is, For Whom Did Christ Die? A doing theology course. I'll explain that more in page two, so I needn't deliberate on it here. First of all, these introductory uh, remarks. The procedure will be as always in my classes like this. I mean, anybody in the class is permitted to, encouraged to, uh, speak his piece or raise a question or want information or whatever twice in a given morning, but only twice in a, uh, in a given morning. This study constant, just raise your hand or blurt out or stand up or whatever to get my attention if I don't happen to see you. This study concentrates on one of the most vital doctrines in evangelical religion. I mean evangelical Christian religion, of course. In fact, for many, especially today, it is the breaking point or the breakaway point in their evangelicalism. Those of you who are in the Hodge class, remember at the very beginning, Hodge was pointing out we all are systematic theologians. It's the nature of the human mind to think systematically. Those of you who aren't theologians professionally and so on, you hear an expression like uh, truth in advertising. Well, if a question like that is raised, you know well, full well, the question of uh, the company about whom it is raised and so on is not flatly contradicting itself. It is apparently doing something that the questioner thinks is inconsistent with its avowed principles. So there's a question of whether this is really true according to the avowed principles. Now that's systematic thinking. It's consistent thinking. Does so-and-so imply such and such, and if so, is conduct contrary to that or policies contrary to that or the can you make the original we're all systematic theologians you can't escape it some people go into a state of trauma and paralysis at the thought of it as if that's too much that's too professional that's for gerser and kick and people like that and so on it's for us to a greater degree than to you that's all but it's your concern uh, as well and it's an interesting thing to see how how this does affect people for example years ago a book was written the Light That Failed. It was a story of six, if I remember, uh, highly educated, enlightened people who became communists. Every one of them became disillusioned. And fundamentally, as I recall, the book has been 20 or so years since I've read it or so, the thing that disillusioned them about communism was not Karl Marx, not his theory and so on. The thing that fundamentally got to these people was the fact that they couldn't see that the alleged product was being produced, that the outcome which they had been led to think would be forthcoming, was not forthcoming. They didn't know where the theory broke down. They don't seem to have been intellectually reconstructed as anti-communists. They didn't lay the ax at the theoretical root of the tree, but they just were looking for results and they weren't finding it. And they were concluding very much as, for example, the founder of the Seventh-day Adventists. He had it calculated that Jesus Christ was going to return in 1843. Christ didn't return in 1843. He knew his calculations were wrong, but he didn't know where. And then he reinvestigated, and he thought he found where, and he calculated 1844. Jesus didn't come in 1844, and he knew he had made a mistake again. And he finally gave up, saying, I don't know where my mistake is, but obviously I've made a mistake, and you people who've been criticizing me haven't put your finger on it either. But the point is, things have to hang together. And in this case, in this other case, uh, uh, William, uh, William Miller became a disillusioned predictor of the return of the visible return of Jesus Christ. It's another story how Seventh-day Adventists uh, survived that and so on. These communists left their communism because of the, that product. In dispensational Christian theology, it's a very interesting thing. The weakest link in their chain seems to be pre-tribulationism. And I have met any number and read a good many more who, once they came to doubt, the soundness of that, to me, minor link 
in the whole dispensational theme, they gave the whole thing up. It didn't, it, it, what happened here is they thought the thing was practically unbreakable. Once they found that little broken link, then they realized it was not unbreakable at the end of the investigation. But the point is, it didn't hold together, in their opinion, at one point. And this has broken Bible schools and all sorts of groups up just because a person has deviated. And you wonder why so much fuss about so little. Well, it's because, little or not, links hang together. And if there's actually a missing link, you know full well everything is up in the air. And no matter how well the rest of it hangs together, it doesn't hang together as a, a system. So this is a doing theology course and looking at the system of thought in relationship to the whole uh, Bible. Almost all contemporary conservative Christians are saying today that Jesus Christ died for every human individual. I repeat that just to lay upon you. I think this is a profound heresy, and for me it cuts the guts out of me to have to say this, but as an historian who knows something of what's going on, I say without fear of any contradiction that almost all, certainly an overwhelming majority, I would say 90% at any rate, of contemporary conservative Christians are saying that Jesus Christ died for the salvation, for the expiation of the guilt of every human individual. For example, the recent book, Grace Unlimited, takes this position. Its contributors, all well-known evangelicals, some of them even reformed, include Clark Pinnock, editor, Vernon Gra Grounds, Howard Marshall, Donald Lake, Grant Osborne, Skevington Wood, and many others. Clark Pinnock is particularly notable because he's one of the sharpest uh, men in the evangelical field. He, had, he moved from Reformed theology before he made this particular unfortunate break. A person like Vernon Grounds, both of these are good friends of mine, a person like Vernon Grounds uh, is, a, um, is still um, considering himself Reformed. He didn't make a conscious break uh, with it, but here they are advocating something which is absolutely the death of real Reformed theology, and they are too sharp not to know it. All dispensational evangelicals, without an exception, to my knowledge, likewise maintain this sad departure from biblical doctrine. That list includes Charles Ryrie, John Walbert, Charles Wendell, John MacArthur, Billy Graham, Jerry Falwell, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Those of you who read the Eagle Beacon I saw Mike Royko take off on Rex Humbard the other day, and what's left of Rex Humbard would come under this indictment also. He'd hold it. That's about every nationally, internationally known evangelist holds that. Again, I'm open to confrontation of that. I don't know every uh, dispensationist who lives or has written and so on. There might be someone somewhere, but I've never known it in the system. It has no room in the system, and a very avowed opponents of this doctrine that, uh, that some of you may know. Yes, please. James Baker and uh, Pat Robertson. Right, right. I've had I've heard Pat Robertson enough to say yes, definitely Pat Robertson. I don't know Baker well enough to I haven't heard him often enough. Yes, please. You're not saying he does. You're just asking no, the question. Asking I I can answer one. I can't answer the other. In coming to your classes, we've learned, of course, and uh, you have shown us the biblical words mm -hmm. to back this up. Yeah, that's what this whole course is about. Isn't it? So where do these these are outstanding people? Oh, where do I read these Where do they get this? Where do, where well, do that's in a certain sense what we're going to be doing through the whole course, Larry. See this? I'm going back to a 17th century debate, but this is a 20th century debate. Only it was more thoroughly done in the 17th century than it was done in the 20th century. Most of us will look like amateurs alongside of John Owen and, uh, and Thomas More, as a matter of fact. But it's the same debate, and it's a highly biblical debate. And such thing. When we were dealing with some of these contemporary issues, we were dealing with people way out in the left field who had no vestigial remains of the Christian religion. Some did and some didn't, but in, in some cases like that. I mean, I'm not talking now about Asimov and B.S. Skinner and people like that, you see, who are fighting to the death for their anti-theistic theories that we were dealing with in Hodge last week. I'm talking now about people who believe the same Bible we do, hold to the inerrancy doctrine, are utterly committed to the deity of Jesus Christ and to the uh, salvation by grace and justification by faith. I'm talking about the people who are thoroughly conservative people. You, Anybody, you, some, of, some of you must have the Ryrie Bible. I know I have one. It's presently mislocated. If anybody wants to donate one, I'll be glad to get another one. And so on. It's a very fine exposition. Ryrie's an excellent scholar. And remember that though you're concentrating in this course on one issue, the question is how crucial that issue is. But that doesn't say that in the, um, in the uh, uh, literature of Billy Graham, think of all the good that man does around the world and so on. But nevertheless, his evangelism is resting on this proposition. He voices it time and time again. I've heard him and read him many, many times. 
I don't know whether he'd go out of business if, I, if he read this and became convinced. It was a profound mistake on his part. I don't know whether he'd go out of business or not. He'd certainly change his fundamental evangelism. I think I did tell you one time when I was up in Buffalo, New York, preaching uh, for a, a friend of his, a friend of mine, and so on, who was more or less persuaded of the Reformed faith, and yet he was the man in charge of the Graham campaign in Buffalo at that time. And uh, I said to him, why don't you talk to Billy sometime? And so he laughed. He said, well, if, he, if Billy was ever convinced of this, and we weren't going through this, we were going through the general Reformed theology and so on, it would change his evangelism fundamentally. Somebody near Graham, as I am not near Graham, and so on, ought to talk to him and so on about it. But the fact remains, this is no mere academic issue, though it's going to be conducted in a very close uh, analysis uh, throughout. But what I'm saying here is don't throw out the baby with the wash. If you become convinced that Owen is right and that Gerstner's right in his, uh, his support of Owen and that that is the biblical position, you can become quite angry because this is a very serious error if you ever see it, see it as such. And the danger at a time like that, especially with people who think only in terms of black and white, is to throw out all the good. Jerry Falwell doing an incalculable amount of good. That debate he had last week at U Oxford University, Randy, were you reading about it and so on, with Ranga of uh, New Zealand and so on? He's just all over the globe and he's doing all sorts of good. In that particular case, he would try to persuade them to take out nuclear defenses and so on without success, but it was a close vote. And he gets riled, I mean, I mean he gets, uh, he gets, uh, he and Riley he's very composed and so on, but he gets uh, ribbed constantly and uh, ridiculed and all sorts of uh, abusive behavior and so on. I thank God for. And not a man here for whom I'm not grateful to God in many, many respects, but every one of these persons is committed thoroughly to the proposition that uh, uh, Jesus Christ died to save every human being. One wonders how so many scholars who believe in the very inerrancy of Scripture could so sadly depart from biblical doctrine at this point. Christ's death is surely the heart of the Christian gospel, and for whom he died is the heart of the heart. How can so many who trust for their salvation on the death of Christ believe that he died also for those who never do trust in him? It seems passing strange on the surface of it. If this can be the heart of the heart of the gospel, that there can be this profound cleavage. We're not talking now about peripheral issues. Even baptism and predestination and matters like that recede into relative important, unimportance in comparison with a matter like this. And here at the heart of things comes this very difference among people who are utterly committed to the absolute infallibility of Holy Scripture. But there can be no doubt in the minds of these errorists where they get their doctrine, in their opinion. Where they get, I, I think I know where they get their doctrine. It doesn't come out of the Bible, but in their opinion, it does come out of the Bible. I'll throw out at this particular juncture what I think is the source of this. And... Um, what I think is really not important, but nevertheless, this question I'm raising in this paragraph is a funny thing. How can people who believe so completely in the inspiration of the Bible and are determined to be controlled by it differ on a, on a point as crucial as this? We all agree. If Charles Ryrie was sitting here, for example, or Billy Graham or someone, he'd say, I agree with you completely on this, Gershner. Well, I'm going to follow the Bible. And I would say to him, I'm going to follow the Bible. The Bible is the word of God for you, and the Bible is the word of God for you. And what it teaches, we're going to follow. Now, and the second thing we both agree on is this, that one of us is wrong. And we also agree seriously wrong, deadly wrong. There's, nobody's going to put this away as a trifling doctrine. This is a very important doctrine. And we would agree that if, I would agree if Ryrie and Graham and all the rest of them are right, John Owen, John Calvin, and all the rest of them are wrong, and Jim Boyce and people like Sproul and myself and others who are living today who are saying the same thing are wrong. We'd agree with that. I would say for him, you're right. I have a wrong. I'm like, I'm like Miller. I don't know where I'm wrong. You may not have shown me my error, but you've convinced me I am in error. And one thing is certain. Once you convince me I'm in error, I don't have to see where I made it. I know I'm in error, and I'm going to apologize and correct and undo as much harm as I possibly can do. And he'll say the same thing. The one thing that must be ruled out I had a rather sharp exchange with somebody not long ago on this particular point. Well, one thing that must be ruled out is laughing at the idea that John Gerstner or uh, Charles Ryrie could change. That is a catastrophic, slanderous remark to either one of us. If any of you smile at the thought that two people, 70 years of age, committed for years and decades to teaching this sort of thing, 
with one foot in the grave, as it were, just before they put the second foot in there and so on, are incapable of changing. You are slandering me. And I'll ask for your apology if you're even thinking about it. Shame on me. When I put that second foot in the grave, if that's the second foot of a man who is incapable of recognizing error and admitting it and so on, I am putting that in the grave of hell. And the same thing would be true of Charles Ryrie. He would say exactly the same thing. If we really are controlled by Scripture, we're going to let it speak. And I'm speaking louder now because I'm talking to myself because most of you are younger and less experienced than I am. This is a greater danger for me in a sense than it is for you, but don't think you are immune to it. There can be no doubt in the minds of these errorists where they got their doctrine. I, I didn't explain where I thought. I think they get their doctrine funda fundamentally from this. I'm sure it's what bothers Billy Graham. I think they think you can't preach evangelistically unless you can say Jesus Christ died for you. Unless I walk up to a total stranger, either in private or in public proclamation, unless I walk up to a person, speak to a group of people, or speak one-on-one -on -one to a person who I don't know. For example, I never knew Larry in my life. I just get into conversation with him this afternoon, and I recognize he's a Hindu or a Jew or an unbeliever or a pagan or something. One thing he is not as a Christian, and he's on his way to perdition. He needs Christ as a savior and so on. And I want to try to win Larry Cowley for all I'm, I'm worth and so on. Well, I just can't see, some of these people would say, how if Larry said to me, all right, Gershner, I get your whole message. I'm a sinner, and I'm under the judgment of God, and Jesus Christ shed his blood for the remission of sin, and if I believe, I will be saved. Well, yes, you hear me right, Larry, and so on. Uh, then Christ did die to save me. And I would say, I don't know, Larry. You don't know? You mean he may not have? All this that you say is true, the package that I bought and so on, but I'm an unconverted person, and Christ may never have shed his blood for me. That is absolutely true, Larry. I'll look you eye in the eye and say it. I don't know it whether it is or is not. I only know that you are under a mandate now to believe on Jesus Christ and be saved. And if you do not, it's going to be Larry Cowley's fault. Now, there are people who simply can't say that, either in eyeball-to-eyeball -eyeball conversation or in a public declaration. They have got to say, Larry, Jesus Christ died for you. And if you perish, it's going to be Larry's fault and Larry's alone. You have it within you to respond to him. And if I couldn't say that with confidence, I wouldn't even be in the business of uh, propagating the gospel at all, you see. And th this would, I, I, really, I wish I had these men here now. They'd say, yeah, that is exactly our problem, Gershon. How do you get around it? Well, you see, the first thing I would say is that's not my problem to get around it. If that is what the Bible says, that's what I've got to tell Larry Cowick or anybody, any other stranger I meet. You'd agree with that, wouldn't you, Billy? Yes, I'd agree with that, that's true. If that is what the Bible says, even though that demolishes my present uh, method of evangelism, the, the evangelism has to go, not the Bible, and so on. But then he'd say, all right, granted that, but uh, let's suppose for the sake of argument that what you're saying is true. How do you go about evangelizing? What if it, when Larry's about to go out the door there because he doesn't know and so on, oh, I'd say, I'd say to Larry, now wait a minute, Larry, you are a sinner. We've convinced you of that. Aren't you? You're under the wrath of God, aren't you? Yes. If you're going to be saved, it's going to be faith, yes. And it's going to be faith that's given to you by God. Yes. But isn't there nothing for Larry to do? Larry doesn't know he's rejected. God doesn't know. Larry doesn't know Christ hadn't died for him. I can't say he has or has not and so on. All I know is I say to Larry as he goes out that door, if you, unless you can assure me that Christ died, well, I'm not going to pay attention. I can't assure you of anything, Larry, but if you go out that door turning your back on the mere possibility of something, you're an idiot. You're asking for it. And you'll certainly realize, wouldn't you grant that, that Charlie Larry and so on? Yes, I grant that. That's true. And then they'll say, okay, you, you, you keep him from going out the door, so he sits down again and so on. He says, all right, Gershon, I realize I'd be a downright idiot if in circumstances like that I behaved in a manner such as that. And now I recognize something that's really been shattering to me, namely that and I've heard other fundamentalists, you know, talk to me before and so on, but they've always assured me of the fact that Christ died for Larry Cowick, and if, if uh, uh, Larry doesn't get saved, it's going to be Larry's fault and so on. Now, you're telling me differently. And uh, so it's going to be my fault, all right, but Jesus may not have that. All right, now, I've got, to sh I've got to shift all my intellectual furniture. I've got to think of the whole thing. I was ready to slam the door in your face on this, but you've shown me how idiotic that would be, and so on. So I'm sitting down, I'm listening. Now, what am I supposed to do since I don't know? I was like, well, I'd say to him, you should do everything in your power. For example, you should be faithful to your wife. You should be industrious in your business. You should read the Bible. You should come to church and listen to what's preached. Don't sing the hymns of Zion when you don't believe it as a professional hypocrite and so on. Don't pray with your family at night when you know yourself a stranger to God. 
Throw God, throw yourself on the mercy of the court. God says, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. And I hope, Larry, that God will have mercy on Larry Kelly. And if Larry, God is going to have it, that's the way it's going to come. But he can't say anything more, but it'll give you plenty of reasons for the seek seeking for the rest of your life. But anyway, yeah, go ahead. But anyway, before you take it, you understand what I'm saying here? We, we're not getting into the nitty of gritty at the moment. I'm just asking, I'm just answering my own question. Why would so many people so thoroughly committed to the Bible and evangelical Christianity balk at a reason like this? They're going to argue the Scripture is on their side against this other position, and that's what we're going to be doing in this particular court. But I'm saying to you right now, I don't think the Scripture is with him. You may think otherwise, and I want you to sit loose on them. Don't hesitate to, you know me well enough to know. I welcome your criticism. You don't, I don't want anybody believing anything because John Gershner believes it. If I can show you something in the Scripture that convinces you well and good. But I'm saying it's not really Scripture. What really drives them is the fact that they can't get it through their head that they could have an op academic, I mean, an evangelistic opportunity believing that doctrine. Yes, please. Another common phrase that's used that's the same as this is the fact that God loves you and God loves everyone. Is that correct? Yes. Now, the God loves you, when you come to that phrase, you have to remember there's a, there's a linguistic problem there. Let's, we've gone over it before, but I won't be unhappy if we go through it 50 more times before May comes around and so on. God loves you in, in one sense, love of benevolence and love of complacency. These are two different senses. God loves you in the sense that, as, as Christ says, he makes his sun to shine and his rain to fall on the unjust as well as on the just. Now, that is an act of benevolence, which means willing well. He does good to you. Every sinner in this world has life. He has some health. He has some satisfactions and so on. And all of that is a kind of love of benevolence. But the love of complacency means a love of a pleasure, a love of pleasure or satisfaction in a person. And God not only does not have that, for the unregenerate didn't have that for you in your unregenerate state and doesn't have it for any other person in his unregenerate state. He has exactly the opposite. God is angry with the wicked every day. The wrath of God rests upon them. And the reason I've, I've warned you about putting that sign, that, that, uh, that plate on the rear of your car, God loves you and so on, is that to say that properly, you ought to give a mini exegesis. That is, with a love of benevolence, not with a love of complacency. And if you do not repent, you'll certainly perish. But it's hard to get that on a slogan. But if you leave it the way it is, God loves you, you can be certain that at least 95% of the persons will misunderstand that. God loves you. Those 90% of the people will misunderstand you. That'll be a kind of soporific for the hitman for the mafia who just made 50,000 liquidating an unwelcome uh, citizen on, from the planet uh, Earth. God loves you, he says. That's far better than any pills you could buy in a drugstore, and so on. God loves you. God doesn't love you that way, not the way he thinks. God, if God loves you, see, if God loves everybody now, then why would Jesus Christ die? Because it doesn't depend on your faith in him or anything else. Why would uh, the day of judgment be a necessity? Why would hell be a reality, and so on? If God loves you this way, he loves you with this, which gives you an opportunity to believe in Jesus Christ, and when you come to Jesus Christ, then you're accepted. How? in the beloved you're not acceptable in yourself you're accepted in the beloved he is the one who is the object of real divine love of complacency this is my beloved son in whom i am well pleased the question here is okay. i covered it there All right any other question while we're looking at that this is an introductory session so i don't mind if we don't get into the a text this morning that we probably will dip into it so we get the feel of the of the way we'll, we'll proceed but this background is extremely important i think but there can be no doubt in the minds of these are where they got uh, to the man and to the woman they will say that it comes from the bible itself in fact they will wonder how the reformation can have failed to see this they feel driven by hundreds of texts as they see them to the universal design or intention of the atonement that is in non-theological language christ died to save every human being they even wonder what blinds reform Christians to such clear, obvious, and constant affirmation of the Bible and of Jesus Christ himself. I was expressing my amazement, you see, that people devoted to the Bible could ever believe such a doctrine as that. If Charles Ryrie was standing here, or Jerry Falwell, or somebody like that, he would wonder how anybody could ever believe otherwise. Now, there's a, I, I happen to know this John Gerster and so on, for example. He believes otherwise. Now, he believes the inspiration of the Bible. He believes this in error. He believes just as I do about the deity of Christ and so on. And yet, I have no doubt about that, and I bear him witness on that, but at the same time, he actually believes 
that Jesus Christ only died for certain persons. I can't understand it. There are hundreds of texts in the Bible which uh, indicate otherwise, yeah, they think, and so on. So that's what we're going to look at, and that's what makes this such a vital uh, matter. One thing is evident to all. This theological aberration appeared again soon after the Reformation and has since become ever more widespread and dominant.